Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Finish More Music podcast. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Mr. Chris Liebing, who is one of the most in demand and best DJs in the world. He's been a club promoter. He's the owner and runner of the iconic label CLR, a podcast host, a producer. In short, is a man who's had a huge, deep impact on our scene. Chris, thank you. Delighted to welcome you to the show. Well, Keith, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the really nice introduction. That's too nice of you. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm absolutely, you know, excited to understand sort of how you've come to this point and obviously dig into what you do in the studio and all of those different things. So I think a really good kicking off point will be right at the beginning. I know that you worked in a, a record shop way back. What have been the sort of the influences? What got you bitten by electronic music and, and techno and how did you really get into this world and find such a passion and desire to have achieved all of these things that I just mentioned? I think that there's generally two two reasons for that if I if, if you ask me that way. Um, first of all I've been kind of DJing since I was 15 years old or something because I always was really interested in, in or listening to a lot of music let's put it this way recording it on on good old tapes and uh, so I naturally always had the biggest music collection amongst my friends. So when we did uh, parties in somebody's basement or somebody something like that, I was always like, hey, you know what, I'll, I'll do the music uh, because none of you know how to play. I know it, you know. So there's a certain sense of uh, of um, I can do it. You can't do it. You know, it's like I, you know, that's my field of expertise here. And uh, that continued that I uh, started to have my first uh, DJ um, gigs in clubs that was beginning of the 90s. And I play kind of all sorts of music, you know. I've always been only playing music that I like. So I have to put this in front. Even, if, and I, even prior to techno and house times, I was uh, basically playing the music that I liked. But it was anything between rock and acid jazz and, and, and all that stuff, you know um and and even pop music uh things that you can basically dance to and what got me with the electronic music was in the beginning of the 90s there were quite a few people in the little hometown where i come from it's a little north of frankfurt that already were djing techno and there was a quite a we had a quite an amazing record store called downtown records which uh, imported records um had had a pretty good connection for for import records as well from from either london and new york so so it was a good selection in that store and uh, that's where i kind of got in touch with uh, the other djs who picked out only the techno records but th this was the very like hardcore techno crew you know and i was kind of considered the commercial dj so i wasn't in that holy circle and um but what i really liked what, what was you know every time i dj even though with the other music i tried to dj it in a way that you would create an atmosphere in a night which didn't was wasn't interrupted by breaks so of course we were like blending in music in and out because there was some music with there that you couldn't mix but as soon as i was able to mix music you know i played some 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 houseier stuff as well i was like able to like blend it in together so people would stay on the dance floor it was always my task or my my idea that i don't give people the chance to even think a, a second about oh let's go to the bar and get a drink you know a new song is starting like no no you just got to keep them there i was like always like in my mind and i realized pretty quickly like oh wow i you know i not not only do i like the energy of techno and house I played a lot of like strictly rhythm stuff as well in the beginning. I, I even still love it today. Um, so I've not always only been a, a techno head. I've always also been a, a house head as well. And I really like the fact that you could just like extend those mixes and blend them in and in together. And pe so people wouldn't realize where the one song ended and the next song started. And obviously the energy of the music. And it just, it was just next level for, 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 for people on the dance floor for, for dancing. And that ultimately got me to the point where I was like, you know what, all the other music is fine. It's I, I still love it. I still love to listen to all that stuff. But I want to concentrate on, on, on house and techno because that's the way to go. And that's that's what eventually happened. And um, 
uh, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> oh, it was, yeah, that was really it. How you got oh, that to, was it. Good. <laughs> to techno. And and so that I mean, that's really interesting how the, the DJ gets intertwined into yeah. that. And then obviously there was Spin Club in 1994. And it's I find it really amusing because I thought, oh, 1994, it's not that long ago. But it is. It's pretty much three decades ago. Right. <laughs> you, and you just go, the yeah, date, I'm, the dates. So yeah, it just I'm mind blown quite, by that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did that come about? Is it, it feels like it was a natural progression now that you'd moved into that genre. Um, if you can talk to that, please. Well, funny enough, that was uh, uh, literally um, out, out of uh, necessity to open this club because that was essentially the same menu where I was working as a DJ, as a, let's say, normal music DJ. Um, and that venue, like the owner was just like really old by that time. It was kind of this very successful venue in that in that little town because it was open till 3 a.m., which which uh, other places didn't have that license. So you would you would you would have a lot of uh, a crowd coming in after 1 a.m. who still wanted to go out and, and have a dance and have a blast. And he was pretty old. He ran this club for like 20 years and he was like, you know, I see you're really enthusiastic about the music. And don't you want to like like take it over, you know, just do your thing here. And I was at university at that time, really not doing anything at university, <laughs> just standing in the cafeteria drinking uh, 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 coffee and, and, and not really like not knowing what, what to do with my life. And I was like, oh, you know what? No one, that was the main reason actually was no one is going to hire me as a techno DJ ever because I, I don't have any reputation as a techno house DJ. Like, how do I get into this scene? You know, I've I've not been really out to other places as I was DJing myself most of the weekends, you know, so there was a lack of connections anywhere besides the record store. And so I was like, all right, if I take this club and, and turn it into sort of like a, a dance club my, for, on my on my in my ideas, then I can hire myself as the DJ. And that's that was the point. So I, I started doing the Saturday nights and I and I did like, uh, let's say, techno house nights. And that was uh, that was actually working out. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't and I was never really a good business person. So on the business side of things, you know, I let most people in for free. The, the bouncers were always hating me when I was standing in the door because, you know, I kind of knew all the people it was like, oh, come in, don't in you pay. When I was behind the bar, I would all just also give out the drinks all sorts for free. It was not really working on that that respect. But I, I ran it for almost one and a half years. And in that time, I started, and that's kind of one of the most important things when you start out as a DJ, um, start out in the scene in general, you know, you need to make contacts, you need to find, you need to uh, find like-minded people who work with you and you need to, to, to make uh, connections, you know, connections with, uh, with people who have, who have certain things to say in that field and, and knowledge in that field, you know. And making connections is not only about like, oh, I'm trying to talk to this person. You have to sort of uh, build up a certain trust with people, you know, by like, oh, he's doing this for quite a while, you know. So I started booking DJs from Frankfurt, you know. I started to, to have a relationship with them, you know. And uh, funny enough, my manager today is actually one of the early DJs that I booked back then. That's that's like that's how far it goes wow. back, and so you started to make some good connections, and these connections were were built on on kind of your your own little reputation on trust, and that's when when the club closed, I was able to basically slide into this this music business or into into this industry, uh, by by starting to work for a label back then, Art, uh, Hard House IQ, which was then located near Frankfurt. I moved to Frankfurt, you know. Um, I, I understood pretty early that you do have to like, like throw yourself in, in that. It, you, you cannot just sit at home and mix, mix tapes and say like, I'm a, I'm a great DJ, I can mix this and send them out blindly to people and hope that somebody, that might, might happen, you know, in a, in, a, in a perfect world. But you need to, to gain the trust of people who might want to hire you as a DJ. So it's kind of like step-by-step -step work, 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 work. And uh, that's kind of, you know, it would build up over the years then, 
until I got my uh, first residency in a techno club, which ended up being the Omen Club in Frankfurt, which was at that time one of the best known clubs in the world for techno. So um, it was uh, kind of luck being at the right time and the right space kind of thing, um, but also working up to this. Yeah, I mean, I'm a firm believer in the idea of you make your own luck because it had you have been given that opportunity but you hadn't put the work and the dedication in up until that point you'd have never actually been able to to grab that opportunity exactly and, and the the other thing that you mentioned which I, I think is so true because when I used to DJ I was always everywhere I could be in London at all the parties meeting people talking to the promoters supporting their nights showing up and doing yes. all of those things and I think now it's really interesting because we live in a world with the social media and all the connectivity, but often people end up more isolated and they don't go out. And as you said, just send things out on the internet and that personal interfacing, I, I think, and, you know, of course, you're the, the ultimate expert in this, certainly in the world of clubbing is as important as it's ever been, I think. Absolutely. And I can see, uh, I see this, see this now 30, like, what was it? 30 years later, I guess. <laughs> 28, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 28 years later, 28 years later. Yeah. I, I, I see this from my perspective now too. You know, if I, if I, I don't randomly, I mean, I, I randomly listen to demos. I do. Yeah. And there's maybe occasionally a good demo, but before I would release any of this, uh, I would start to build up a relationship or, or, or some sort of like connection with this artist because I want to, I want to see where this. It's not only about the music. It's also about the character, the personality, the person who's behind that. Is like, um, you know, you you want to know who you work with, you know, and and uh, uh, that's you know sometimes you get referred to. Oh, this artist released on my label. Maybe you, maybe you want to listen to his music, and then you find out. Oh, you know, there's got to be a story to, to to come along. It just can't come out of nowhere. And it's exactly right what you say. You have to be ready for that moment, which you would call the luck moment. You have to be ready for this and and work worked until then somehow. Yeah, and it's a good opportunity, I think, to just talk on the on the label front, and we'll dive in more into into CLR as we as we move forward. How many demos do you get at CLR as a? I, I you know, <laughs> like uh, I mean, with be, be, I, I let's say how do I say it? I'm in the phase three with my label, and because I had it kind of four to five years on a on a on a hiatus, I, I had it frozen for a while. Um, before this phase, like the last, the first two phases, let's say beginning from the 90s to first 15 years, uh, end of the 90s, first 15 years, um, there was uh, quite a few demos coming in and I always felt bad that I couldn't listen to, to, to everything. And honestly, by now, I don't even have an address where you can send demos to um, because I know I cannot handle it. Um, and so the way I work now is exactly what we talked before. I am waiting for these people who I have heard about, you know, who, who might be somewhere in the realm of, you know, this, this new artist that I pick here, like, uh, um, uh, has, has a friend who's producing music and, and that's how you, there's still enough demos coming in, even that you don't have a demo address, you know, that's there's amazing. still loads coming in. I still get the random uh, USB sticks at, at events, but a very good example. Let's put it this way: a very good example is Frankie Bromley. It's 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 uh, he's he's released um, uh, the first CLR release in the in the, in this third phase in a new phase when I restarted the label in a way last year. And the way I got to know him, I was on on let's say album promo tour for my Burn Slow album on Mute Records, and I was playing in Manchester um uh, at the uh, i think it's the warehouse events and i did an in-store record appearance and frankie was like at that time i think 17 years old and he was in the crowd and he was just constantly asking the best questions you know like it was kind of a q and a and and he was just like oh i have this question i have this question and i immediately like picked out that 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 young person there was like that's really interesting question he's asking and so he lingered around he did everything right you know it's like it's a good example he w once that event was over he lingered around and he was just standing in the corner not you know not too pushy but also not too shy you know and i was just like hey you 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 you, you 
asked some really cool questions. Are you, are you making music? I actually asked him, are you making music? And he's like, yeah, I make music. And I was like, you know what? I'd love you to send me some music, you know? Ooh. And um, that's how things happen. That's a good example how how how, how things happen. And, uh, and uh, he's, he's been releasing on various labels by now. I think he's like 21 by now or 22. And he's making awesome music. So this is how he got into the scene then, you know? He did, he did kind of the right things, you know? He was... You know, and he's probably not, I was not the first record store appearance artist that he attended to. So he put a lot of work into this, you know, mm -hmm. and I knew because of his questions that he had a quite a, a good background of knowledge, you know, so he must have gained it from somewhere. Oh, he knows the right things, you know, he, he knows where, how things need to be. Yeah. Yeah, student of the game, tying into what you were saying about people's character, dedication, commitment. And I think that that's something that's so easy for people to overlook. And of course, the music is is an absolutely vital piece of the puzzle. It's got to be there. However, there are human beings. This is a transaction. If you're as a, a record label owner, you're going to invest time, energy and effort into somebody you want to be working with people who are, who are bringing professionalism and all of those things and a knowledge and a real passion and love who are going to invest in the label. So it's, it's something I think a lot of people overlook and it's really, yeah. really valuable in, in the insight and advice. Thank you. So talking about the label, obviously hundredth release is, is out, which is, uh, is absolutely superb. If we jump back to the beginning of it, cause I know you've been involved in other labels as well, but CLR particularly, what was the, inspiration what made you decide hey I'm, I'm gonna start this label it was actually all already the third label that i was doing or let's say in, in a way involved because the very first label was it was it was kind of a house label that i started with three friends from my old home hometown um uh and it was called soap records and that we started that in uh, 94 i believe and we we were lucky at that time, I think, because we 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 produced a certain kind of house music. If people want to check it out, it's uh, there, there were uh, we called ourselves EHR. It's just like an acronym for nothing. We didn't have an, an idea what we would call ourselves, and we we pretty quickly worked together with people from Strictly Rhythm and stuff like that. It just it just happened like that. I I, I have no idea why and how, but then again, I do because we made the effort to fly over to Miami, which was back then still called the uh, winter music conference you know to to get in touch with people uh, we had a great distribution we had various great distributions around this area for records and one of them was discomania and uh, that's where i briefly worked as well and and uh, they imported a lot of records from new york so we had some contacts you know so we were able to like talk to people and hand out our vinyls and we were lucky that the first three releases became quite successful so that was the first label i was involved with but then my my my, my love for techno grew 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 and then i started a label called fine audio recordings which i just short put on short audio on the labels it was just black labels with uh, written audio in it 01, 02, 03 but I did this with another uh, company and uh, that's that would be another good um, advice for young artists like always like maybe be a little bit more careful who you work with look into the legal things you know don't look first for a manager look for an accountant you know <laughs> because uh, a manager can come second the accountant should need, need to come first when you start to make money and, and somebody who's kind of like advising you a little bit on the legal side so i was starting a label called fine audio recordings with with another company back then and uh that w went off quite well audio seven um which um was my uh kind of breakthrough release as a techno artist was released in 97 and it was like the first record that um was yeah was sold in the states was sold in brazil and i was suddenly like oh this is cool you know like making music brings you to places or back then I mean, even today on the internet, even more um, to places where you physically haven't traveled yet. So people would already know your name. And if you're like DJing at the same time, it kind of builds up on top of each other and you get a gig here because of your, not only your reputation as a DJ, but also because you had a release out. Um, so with this label, I became fairly successful and, and uh, audio aid. I uh, asked the advent back then who I was and still am a big fan of, you know, it's like uh, Colin McBean and Cisco Ferreira back then. 
and I was a huge fan of their music and I just like I ended up DJing with them and it was just like on stage super shy it's like would you guys are you there was in London um in in, in a club uh, because they had an exchange program with the resident DJs of the Omen Club, you know, that's how it went. I could tell you hours of this, but I was like standing there and they played after me live. And I was like, when they were done, it's like, are you guys around tomorrow? You know, and they're like, oh, we have our st studio up in Kensington Road. Um, here's our phone number, call us and you can come by. And I was like, what? I can come by your studio. This is insanely amazing. And so I built up a relationship with them and asked them ultimately to do a release for my label, which came out under the uh, name Red Eye because they weren't allowed to use the name Advent back then. So um, it still was like, you know, this is kind of how it worked. And, um, and when I, I got to release number 14, I believe, I wanted to leave that company because I find I found them too too intense on on what I was doing and they, they, they wanted to tell me how to do it and I was just like you know I don't want to work with you guys anymore I'm, I'm leaving you and they were like well you can leave but your label can't leave because we got all the paperwork that it's actually our label you know we were paying the bills for the pressing plan so we can prove it's our label and I was like oh I did everything wrong so I kind of lost my label and I moved on to a uh, very famous uh, 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 distribution back then based in London, which was called Prime Distribution. It was handling sort of all most important techno labels in the world. So if you wanted to be part of that group, you know, and, and I knew enough people and I was just like, could I redistribute my label uh, through you guys? And they were like, yeah, sure, come. And they knew the audio label because they were like, yeah, great. And then I had to tell them, it's like, I can't come with my label, you know, <laughs> I've got the, the first release ready, but I don't have that label anymore. And this is how CLR started, because um, I needed to come up really quickly with a new label, a new label name, and just totally restart everything. It's just like, leave everything else behind, you know, all right, let's restart. Let's, let's just find a new label name, a whole new label, and they were up for it. So... I couldn't come up with a name that quickly, so I just simply called it Chris Leaving Recording. <laughs> that's that's how the name came about, and this is how the label then started. I had my first release then in '99 with them. them. And it's just, it's a prime example of resourcefulness. You know, yeah. okay, there's a problem. But how, how do I fix this? How do we how do we get this going? Which is great. So obviously we've we're at the the hundredth release now, and you took the as you said the hiatus. What's the the plan? What would you consider? stage three what's the vision for it oh you know it's a i'm amazed by um i'm firstly amazed that people didn't forget about the label for some reason in those four or five years in this fast living time we have that's another sign for techno to be just a little bit odd in our times because um because people really love it for a long time techno music and there's like and there's always new people joining this big group of people who love techno and they have quite a memory. So um, uh, the, well, the label was welcomed back in a really nice way. And the great thing now is I, I carry a lot more knowledge with me and um, you have a lot more new tools at hand with the internet, you know, with, um, with your knowledge, um, with the reach that you have, with, with the amount of people you can talk to. So my idea is to just continuously, which was the same idea back then, release really good club music, in a way, things that I wanna play at, at, at when I DJ, that's, that's kind of my baseline for, for what I wanna release, um, obviously. Um, but now with all the knowledge, of all the mis previous mistakes that I've done to avoid those, you know, on a business side, uh, on management side, and with a group of people that kind of got together, as I mentioned, like my manager now is the is, is the guy that I booked 30 years ago to my to my club. Um, uh, people that you, you surround yourself with people who have a great knowledge, who are really good in the business and good at what they do, and um, with with. A f with with a fresh set and full with fresh energy since i did have this haters which i did because of my two albums on mute which and I, and I was kind of burned out with releasing stuff at that point and i was just like i cannot i cannot uh, bear the responsibility towards the artist i can't i can't um 
I can't be there for them. And, and if you run a label, you need to really be there for the artists. As you said before, they put a lot of energy, love and, and, and work into their music. And the least thing you can do is like to honor that by releasing at the right time, you know, promoting it in the right way and, and, and putting all your force behind it. And that's why I, I put a stop. So now I'm, I'm back at it and I know exactly what I need to do. And I, and I have a great setup and I kind of also really looking for new talent, you know, like, because I realize now I actually do have a platform. Yeah. Wow. I didn't really realize that before. And it just, it maybe makes a difference. And uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the lookout for young artists who make great music and, and obviously also talking to some of my old artists that, that I've been working with. So a new combination. Yeah. It's very exciting. I have to say. Yeah, awesome. I love it. So when people uh, sort of send music in, if there's, uh, for example, tracks you like, what's the process that you would typically go through? Do you maybe take a demo and, and play it out first? Or do you just, you know, immediately, yes, this is this is going to work. And if you hear a piece of music and maybe think, oh, it's almost there, but it needs some kind of change. Do you work with the artist? What could, what would somebody potentially expect when they sort of get your ear on one of their demos and you've got a spark of interest? It's kind of all what you said right now, but most of, but mostly uh, your last point. Uh, I usually hear something and I, and, and I know, oh, there's potential in there. And that's, oh, I, I, I really like that. And what I do then is I usually like contact the artist and I say, maybe demos that I got sent to, or may, uh, maybe the demos that I got sent to via some other friends, you know, I'm like, yeah, give me, give, give me the contact to this artist. I want to, I want to talk to him. And then I, just, and then I'm, I just recently have that ha happening or happening right now. It's like, I like these tracks, but I don't, I think there's more potential in them. Would you want to revisit them and maybe think about maybe taking that sound out, you know, and, and, and put more focus on, uh, on, on the other sound and, 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 and that, and that little piece. And, and uh, that's one part of it. So there's, there's this discussion starting to happen and I'm a pretty much, I'm a, I'm a sound fanatic. So um, I, I usually try to uh, also get involved in the mixing process <laughs> right. sometimes, you know, um, to, to get, basically the most out of the, this, this music because I know how it needs to kind of work and sound in a club, you know? And um, uh, so it's, it's, it's not like the demo comes in and I release it. That kind of really never happens. It, I, either there needs to be some really good mastering work being done on it or, or, or I discuss with the artist like, yeah, let's, or maybe even I tell the artist, you know what, I really like the stuff that you send me that there's nothing amongst which I would, which I feel like I want to release, but I see you can do it. So how about you sit down and you, you maybe check out the, the recent releases. And with that idea, you sit down again and make some music and send it over to me. That happens quite a lot as well. That's amazing. So, so the artists uh, are working with you. There's this hands-on experience of, you know, um, your experience, both from a sonic quality of the music, but creatively what works on the dance floor and also just the direction of what you like and giving them options and things to think about and go back to kind of help them, which I think is amazing. And um, one of the questions that kind of links back a little bit to you starting your own club night is one of the big routes now that really gets people into DJing is writing music, releasing music, particularly if they, you know, start to get releases on, you know, big labels such as your CLR, get the visibility. How important do you feel being a producer is now tied into getting DJ gigs? Um. I think it's as important as it always has been. I I always felt like when when I got into techno music back then, I pretty quickly, um, you know. But that's my perspective. It doesn't necessarily need to apply to anyone or necessarily be true for for the whole of of, of the industry. But when I got into more and more techno, I pretty quickly and I DJed more and more techno sets. I pretty quickly had the feeling I want to play my own music. You know, I, you know, it's great to play other, mix other people's music together, but I know what I want to achieve on the dance floor. I have the idea in my head, so I better sit down and, and, and make those tracks that I'm looking for myself. So 
I do assume for every, like, you know, I could be wrong there, but that's my, my approach for every techno DJ that it has to be kind of the same way. You know, if you really want to be a techno DJ, you know, there's a re there's just a few examples of techno DJs who are really successful, but don't release their own music, you know, and, um, and I don't even know of anyone, you know, um, like name me one really super huge influential techno artist who does not release really their own music at, at, at sometimes they maybe have a have have a phase for two three four years where there's no release coming out because you're just too busy doing other things but ultimately there's always like a new album like Sven Fate is a really good example he sees he hasn't released a lot of things for like 10 years now but now he's releasing an album you know because he feels like I want to like get my own stuff in there in my in, in in my dj sets as well you know it's just, it's it's just that motivation that you have in you and as i mentioned before you know it's always like it 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 helps each other you know it it helps you getting dj gigs to have some releases out and um it helps you to get some good releases out if you play some dj gigs because then you better know what need what you need to put out there and it just kind of like uh um helps each other yeah. so i think so i think it's it's kind of a given you know in a way yeah, so sort of synergistic the whole thing yeah. growing together and i think this leads us really nicely in so obviously i want, want to talk about your creative process in the studio and the hundredth release on clr is your music so it's a beautiful way to to sort of kick start phase three you know and really as i kick start it you've, there's been some releases recently but it's sort of this as you said exciting uh new phase that's coming in and and what a brilliant way to to put a stamp on that so thinking of that and you mentioned writing music that you want to play when you sit down to write a track what are the first things that you do is there inspiration wise already something in your mind or do you just sit down to play or maybe that there, there it's a, a mixture i don't know but i'd love to get a feel of what happens when you're going into the studio what's in your head before you've even started basically oh how much time do you have <laughs> um, uh yeah well where, where do i start um i'm not i'm not coming out of uh, an environment or a family which had a music background so i never really learned an instrument in my life um so i got to uh, my first steps into music productions was around 93 94 95 in, in in that phase when i got to know andre walter who, who i used to work in the studio together for many 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 years we did all the stigmata series together and essentially he was he was uh, he, you know i had some few instruments but he was the guy who had who had a proper studio so we would meet up and i would learn a lot of th things from him it was i mean days pre be before youtube tutorials you know you just had to like literally figure out your own stuff and um i usually got to the studio with a certain idea of, in my head that came out of the last weekend of djing um so you know i would be djing and i would feel like oh you know this is a great groove this is a great groove uh and i would i would kind of like know the record and i would like uh you know play an idea in the studio and we would start to recreate it in our own way and and take it from there so so uh i once spoke to to uh, i speak to radio slave quite a bit and i find radio slave is one of the best producers on the planet for for electronic music and uh the way he started for example and this is kind of an advice for for uh, younger artists who want to start to get into music productions and this is kind of how i did it too is like you you work with existing music and you make edits and you and and you just turn turn new music into edits and that's you know you you, you don't want to go full on or oh, how am i going to make a sound you want to first like feel how, how 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 music needs to flow for you and everything so you know this this kind of approach i'm not talking about like copying music you know but i'm but it's it's great if you if you like a piece of music just listen to it and and think like what's the good why do i like it and how can i recreate it or maybe take that piece and put it into an edit and while doing this you learn so much about your own working process um so that's kind of one part of it 
but uh, over the years, I evolved to wanted to be in the studio by myself. And, and then in the early 2000s, I started to build my own studio and I started to like learn myself how to do all these things. And, um, you know, you, you, you were saying before that my, my help for all these artists also, especially when it comes to mixing the music, um, it went also both ways because every time I did that, I was learning new things. Um, especially on the mixing front. So in, in the, let's say, in the middle 2000 phase of my CLR, where I released a lot of albums as well from Monologue, Tommy47, uh, Drum Cell, uh, Terence Fixma, I would invite these artists to my studio with their productions, and we would sit down and mix the whole album together. Um, like, and, and, and I knew by doing so, I would also learn a whole lot of new ideas and how did they make that track oh this is a good thing this is a good way that's a great uh, uh, um, um, synth this is great you know all these little things and I've also learned how other people produce music and one of the main takeaways for me was you or what I try to do these these days um, is never really have a certain routine <laughs> you know it's like always try to 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 come with a different approach um i in the pan during the pandemic i kind of moved to switzerland up in the mountains because i i like the mountains i like to ski so i'm, I'm sitting there and it is you know it taught me also that a good balance is very important you can lock yourself away for like three weeks in the studio and come out with nothing um you could go to the studio one day and have a super hit and spend the other 20 days um sitting on the mountaintop and just looking around you know um there is no guarantee of how much time you spend in the studio that you come up with great tracks although you cannot come up with great tracks if you haven't spent loads of time in the studio it it's a weird thing. It's a weird combination. So I have spent insanely long hours in the studio in my life so far with literally no outcome. But then again, sometimes I sit down and I come up with um, an, you know, I never really go into the studio with a certain idea. I kind of like, I kind of like run around with a notepad all the time and also with a recorder. And I maybe hear something, a vocal bit, and I was just like, oh, you know, I'll just grab this for, for now. And then when I go to the studio, I like look at all that stuff and I just, you know, I don't really want to think too much about it. I just look at this stuff and it's like, what appeals to me in this moment now? Oh, there's this, this, this funny clip from this movie where this guy says this. This is how, how this time track came about. Because the time vocal is from Peter Fonda from the movie Easy Rider. He, he, he says something about like, we wanna have a good time. And I was like, That's, he says time in the right way. So I took the, the, just this word time, you know, time. And I just put it there and I put some effects on, on, top, on top of it. So if you get stuck, like that's, I have spent many, many hours in the studio where you had a four bar loop with kick drum running. Boom, 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 boom. And you're like, okay, you know, I need to add something nice, you know? That's a, that's a, maybe a valid work of starting a track. You know, a lot of lots of tracks have been produced starting that, but it's it's not gonna work for a long time. You know, you're gonna get stuck. So maybe what you want to do, you want to always find a different approach, and that's what I mean. Don't find a routine. Don't go down and like punch in a, just a kick drum. First of all, if it doesn't get doesn't get you anywhere, try a new thing. Always go in a studio and try a new thing. I'm st I still don't know what I'm doing, honestly. I'm still like every time a release comes out, even with a CLR 100, I, I'm like, oh, can I go back to it? I knew now, I know now what I want to change. I don't like the sound of this. I don't like the sound of this. And I try to bring it to the next production and to the next production. You know, you, you're constantly learning, but you know, maybe start with a vocal sample and put an effect on it, a delay. And that may be automatically. And I think this is the great thing about music production. I've learned so much from the, my co-producer when it comes to more musical production stuff, uh, Ralf Hildenbeutel, um, who's just this fantastic, insane, great mu mu musician, you know, and 
what I learned through him was the awesome thing with music is if you have the right starting point, which doesn't need to be a groove, it doesn't need to be only a, um, a synth line, it doesn't need to be only a, 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 a sample, it can be any of that, but if it's the right start you have, the rest just sort of happens automatically. It just falls into place. If you force yourself, it will not fall into place. And you're sitting in the studio, you're getting frustrated. It's three in the morning. You still haven't really gotten anywhere. You go the next day and you listen to it and you're like, oh, this is so uninspired. And it's still, that still happens to me. You're not, you know, and I think these times are as important as being productive in the studio. So even now I'm doing something and it's not good. I'm not frustrated by it anymore because I see that needed to happen in order to have these moments of being creative again. And they happen less and less, the more you maybe start out in a different way, you know, maybe go for a walk, come back, maybe don't do anything today, sit the whole day on the couch, drink some tea and watch a movie. And next day you come in and you have a whole different flow. Music is all about you, your inner state and your inner feeling as well. And it's so hard to force music out of you if you're like stressed out. And, um, and, and, if you're having the right starting point, things fall into place. You, you find the right groove, and then eventually you, you, you kind of like automatically find the, find the sound. What's the, what's the biggest problem for most artists is like, they have a great groove running, everything is great, but what now, you know? What, 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 what do we do now? Like, oh, I need a good sound in there. I need a good sound in there. And um, yeah, that's, that's an issue that I still run into too, but maybe start out with this great sound, you know? If you just like don't have a groove, then if you, if you have that issue, then like throw everything away, what you have, and like don't never be afraid of throwing everything away. Like just hit the delete button, forget about it. Like the worst thing you can do is just like, oh, I put so much work into this, I need to keep working on it, you know? No, throw it away and start off fresh and... Uh, even if you start out with a sound that you, you totally like and after working on it for five hours, you, you build something amazing around it. But the only thing that's right, disturbing is that great sound that you started out with. Well, then it's not the great sound anymore. Don't be afraid to delete it. You know, just like it got you to this point. Awesome. It had it function. It doesn't necessarily need to be in your final track anymore. Um, that's part of making making music. That's it's 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 a process. It's not only the result; it's the whole process. And the more you can enjoy the process and let go of certain ideas that you're having, the better the result might be. Yeah. Now that was that was an answer all over the place. I know, but I tried. Oh, to it's, it's interesting because it was so many things that I would have asked about, but you've covered them all, which is which is absolutely brilliant. And I'm a also a big advocate of generating ideas through lots of different ways to spark creativity and also the idea of of picking a solid idea to go with because you're guaranteed pretty much that the track will dry up if you start out with something that's a little bit lame to start with if you just sort of run off with the first thing and it's not really gonna you know move things forward and I also love the idea of sometimes you have to sacrifice something for the benefit of the entirety of the piece of music and that yes. then comes to the idea of trusting yourself that you will keep getting more ideas and you will because we're all creative beings something else will come and maybe that sound you could save it if if it's a problem of saying oh, if i delete it out of this track you know oh no catastrophe i'll never make something this good again yeah. part one is <laughs> well i can back myself that i will and part two is well i'll save it then yeah for for you know maybe start another track with it so no i mean i totally resonate everything you're, you're saying is is like so locked in one of the things you mentioned was the the mindset piece um and i know that you're big into the uh, uh, sort of meditation and those kind of things can you talk a little bit to that the importance of meditation and how you feel that marries up with for example being your best creative self maybe even performance with dj and i don't know yeah, um, I mean, meditating is about is you, you, like a lot of people think that's kind of like this. What is this? It's it's very simple. It's like not thinking. You know, you you, you could do it sitting in the in 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 the subway, uh, sitting in the car. It's like what, what we how do I how do I put it? You you know, if you're constantly thinking about how you want to do stuff, you are not open for creativity creativity is everywhere around us and if if you are totally locked into your thinking mind um 
and you kind of like exactly know how you want to do things that might work out for you to a certain degree but you are not going to allow creativity to come in um and and the flow to come into to to it um the thinking part will eventually happen when it needs to happen and if you overthink things i mean this is generally applying to life or even in the studio um then you most likely uh you you get to something because thinking takes you takes us to places but you're what you're doing is you're blocking out the create create creative flow and um the the less you 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 think the more an opening you give an opportunity for that creative flow to come in it might not come in directly instantly it may need to take a while um so uh this is also what i mean with like take some good breaks go for a walk and maybe do not think about your music um maybe not even don't even listen to music while you do this maybe just like or maybe do some sports you know that's a good thing too something that takes your mind away from 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 this and i mean ultimately the best thing what you could do is like sit down somewhere and meditate for an hour or something which just literally means trying not to think which is almost Im impossible to do but that's a whole different field of meditation you know but there's ways to clear your mind and the clearer your mind is the more open and receptive it is for the creative flow to come in and um and that also means to let go of certain ideas where your track needs to function how it needs to function where it needs to work you know if you're going into the process already by thinking I'm going to be on that big stage, I need to make it work like this, then you probably come up with EDM tracks, which are pretty much, you know, functional stuff, which, I mean, you can argue about it, but are they really great, greatly creative, you know, it's a, it's quite a, it's a set set pattern of how things need to work out in, 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 in that case, but you you might be very successful doing so you know because you're very talented in in those things um i'm not saying that's bad but uh you know it's maybe not as fulfilling in the long run um and by that i mean will you do it for 20 30 years will it be so fulfilling and that's that's the difference with with most techno artists i know now that still make amazing music look at luke slater he's like I mean, mind blowing guy. <laughs> in '93, I held Booster in my hand on Peace Frog, his, the, the, and I was just like this piece of music. People who haven't listened to Booster on Peace Frog by Planetary Salt Systems should really do this after this interview. It's like, wow, this was released in '93. You know, <laughs> this is almost 30 years ago. And now, listen to what he's releasing now. It's still and even more mind blowing, maybe. You know, it's like, Obviously, this wasn't the beginning of techno. Now he, he, you know, he cannot do this by planning what he's doing. The only way he's so successful in this, what he's doing, is that he just, you know, he just makes it. He doesn't think, does it need to work here? Does it need to be okay like this there? It's just like it, it, it flows out of him, and he doesn't interrupt the flow by thinking too much about his career, thinking about, I mean, I, I don't assume what he's thinking, but I'm talking about like generally about myself now too. You know, if you're thinking too much about this and how do I need to, like, how does it need to fit in there? You know, you, you cannot always make great music. It's just impossible. So also be happy with releasing like mediocre music. And it's okay because it takes you through the journey. And it's all about that journey and not, not where you get to. Yeah, totally. And you used a really powerful word in there that I picked up on, which was fulfilling and fulfillment. And the the only way that we get to that is by staying true to ourselves and not selling out to whatever's the most popular thing that's happening at the moment. And of course, there's all the money and the fame and so on. But it, it's really about leaning into what lights you up. And that's been evident from pretty much the first sentence I think you've said in this podcast all the way through is you staying true to yourself and what's lit you up and what you want to do and the records you want to play and the night you want to put on and the label with the music that you want to hear and the artists has been all the way through. It's about what lights you up and staying true to yourself, which has been absolutely epic. So I have a, a couple more uh, questions. One that really came to mind was when you mentioned about um, breaks, taking breaks. How do you manage 
having the podcast, the label, the production, the gigs, the family, and, and all of those things. Do you have any tips for anybody? Because one of the things I'm really big on talking about in the podcast is that creativity is a part of our holistic life. And if you just laser focus on one of them, then the plates will come crashing down somewhere else. And then your life's a life's a mess and whatever you were focusing on is going to go as well. We It's, a, it's really about a balance. So I, I wondered if you had any tips on that. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have to first of all state, and that was actually, if you go back to the beginning of our interview, uh, I said there's literally, uh, is, is, is in, uh, there's kind of two things, and that was the second thing that I was wanted to mention. I am a very lazy person. Like, I'm an extremely lazy person. Um, if I wouldn't have ended up in the music industry, I probably would have had some sort of job which I would have hated, and I would have tried to like uh, get by just I did in school with the least amount of effort, you know, just getting kind of by and, and just make it through. Um, so I need to do something which which I'm passionate about. And then uh, the laziness is, is, is gone. It's just like it, it just it's just fun. It's it's a lot of fun that you know if i needed if i would need to force myself to sit in the studio if i would need to force myself to come up with i have a weekly radio show running since i think 2007 now you know if i would need to be like every like oh i need to do this now of course there's moments i i'm thinking that oh could, damn it's I, I always have my delivery time at one wednesday nights you know which was on the time of this interview last night and so oh no i still have to do this i just came from the states from a trip for two weeks i played in holland that night you know i still need to come up yeah there's moments that you have to push yourself you know but you know you what you're doing it for and it, i i realized pretty early in my life if there's not really a good reason for me to do stuff i don't do it <laughs> it's, just, it's just like that's what i mean by being lazy you know and i know that this this radio show that i'm doing let's slash podcast yala podcast was part of it you know um is is putting the music out there and it gives people stuff to listen to and i love that i always love to put music out there so so there's there's a gr great goal you know there's a good reason for this going to the studio is just not it's not primarily to have a track at the end of it it's just so much fun sitting there and working on your stuff and i'm learning like literally every day i'm still like sometimes feeling like a, comp a pure beginner in the studio like like trying to figure out how that, how that synth works you know mm -hmm. um and uh the same is with the djing you know it's like of course there's parts of djing which i don't really necessarily enjoy it's like going through hundreds of promos and and finding new music but i'm going to put myself in the you know you have to think that way if I have that new music, that night will be awesome. So I put my mental state into that moment where I play lots of new music in that night and I'm super excited by it. So then I'm like, yeah, you're right. You need to listen to new music, you know? And you put yourself into that in, into that mind, mind frame. Um, so uh, you, you end up doing all these things because they're connected with each other. I, I didn't really choose to do them. They were like naturally coming up. It's, it's the same way that I started to explain, like the DJing was a natural thing for me. I was always interested in music and I always felt like I, I know what I need to play next. And I, I you know, it, this, this, this kind of this, um, I don't have the English word for it, like this, this um, um, uh, how do you say, that I, I want to, the, the idea that I know what people want to listen to on the dance floor, I'm very certain in that. I, there's a certain right. phrase, I don't know, I just can't come up with this right now. But um, uh, I, I'm kind of very certain of this. I'm, I have very confident in, in this. So, so by that, naturally, it came that I wanted to produce music. In, in the way that I feel like the people want to listen to this. So naturally, at some point, it came like, um, I always was fond of radio. I always did radio shows. Also in the beginning of 2000s, we had radio shows here in Frankfurt where I was live on air for on a weekly basis um, every Thursday night. You know, not only that I wanted to play the music to people, I always wanted to talk about the music as well. You know, it's like it, it just they, that that urge in me, maybe that's how I can describe it, that urge in me that I 
feel always like I need to 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 force the people to listen to the music that I'm listen that I'm that I'm convinced is good for them. You know, <laughs> like shake the people is like I know it's good for you. Let me listen. Let me play it to you, please. You know, and that urged me. That drove me to eventually do radio shows. So so it all kind of falls together. And yes, I um, I uh, I have two daughters, and in the time where they grew up, I had little time to take care of these things but eventually when you when when in my career got more successful i was able to hire certain people to take tasks that i wouldn't be able to take you know uh, to 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 in in order to get to this goal so what you were mentioning running the label i found someone who was really good in the administrative side of the label so i wouldn't have to deal with this and i could deal more on the creative side running the radio show I have an amazing person, Benny, who basically I can send him my voiceovers. I send him uh, the track listing. I send him the mix, and uh, and he puts everything together. So I don't need to deal with this, you know. So ultimately, all those things you will find ways because your your passion is in there um, to make it to make it work, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, of course, you have to do a lot of things yourself, too, that you don't like to do, like digging for through promos and stuff like that. Uh, but you, you, what, what if a friend of mine used to say, like, you can't have a pizza with everything. Um, so so you have to like, you know, you, you have to deal with with certain things that you might not want to deal with. But you can make it easier by knowing about the results, you, you know, where you want to get to. So maybe, you know, it. It looks like a lot, maybe it is a lot that you put on your plate and that works together, but it all makes sense together. It's kind of all, it, it, it's all connected. It's all within the music world. And then you find ways to make it work. I'm pretty lucky now because, lucky, really weird word for it, but my, my, my daughters are now in the teenage years. So their dad is a little bit like, you know, not that necessary. <laughs> the friends are more necessary. So I'm like, all right, girls, you know, then I have more time for my music, you know, and 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 we have more quality time together. So, you know, uh, so and right now I feel a little bit like in the time before when they were born, I have way more time at hand suddenly again. But I, I do also know I enjoyed my time with the girls in 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 the younger childhood years which was very important for 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 both of us and now they're in their teenage years and and i i can be a little bit more in the background um uh, I, I hear of other artists who uh who basically took breaks for like five six seven eight nine years um, i think one example is like boards of canada you know they didn't release any music i think for 10 years because they were just saying well we we have kids now so there's you know um you know, it's it's just ways to to make it work. I'm I'm not even entirely sure if I answered your question by the way. Uh, yeah, you did. Well, I think there was there was <laughs> I well, at least what I got was a really strong undercurrent from this about finding the joy and the intrinsic motivations, the reasons why you love doing what you're doing, and and find things that light that up and that passion in you, and then acknowledge that yes, there will be some bits that are maybe a bit admin driven or things that don't like you light you up but when you connect those to the things you do and we go back to the idea of fulfillment and joy that that means that even if you're a lazy person as you described yourself your words not mine yes. you'll find that you've got the energy and the motivation to do it and it goes back to what you were talking about creatively in the studio if you're worrying about all the external stuff like the the fame and the being on the stage and all of those things instead of what's true to you and what lights you up it's going to stop you creatively it's going to put resistance in the way of doing things so yeah it all everything tied together it's, absolutely it, exactly it's, it's all tied together and there and 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 just like you could uh, uh, maybe sum it up with like just be in the moment if you're in the studio you're in the studio don't think about like other stuff uh if you're if you know you you will have your business meetings at some point and think about strategies and coming up that's the time to think about that um uh there was there was one more thing i just wanted to mention but it just slipped me um oh yeah deadlines um you know i i learned deadlines are important deadlines are really important if i didn't have deadlines i would be just like forever working on something and not needing to release it um 
the, there's two things to deadlines. At first, the deadline, because this is, I think, a great thing. And if you don't, if you don't have a deadline for your own production, because you could, you would think like, oh, if, if I release this in six months or in twelve months, it doesn't matter. No, put your own deadline somehow in there. You know, because I need to. I I'm only starting to really function when the deadline is coming up. You know. Um, it's like I, I tell my manager it's like don't tell me like six months ahead you know tell me two weeks before or four weeks before and then i'm oh damn i have to do this bam and then i'm automatically focused and it just somehow goes you know it just somehow works so so it's it's that it's that deadlines that um that you need and in order to meet those deadlines forget about being perfect like like if you strive for the 100 percent also in studio in in anything these 20 percent let's aim for 80 percent because these 20 percent between 80 and 100 let literally make no difference for anyone or out there if that hi-hat sounds like or you know it's just it matters to you but just only to a certain degree because once you play the track in a club it doesn't really matter to to anyone so it's it's these 20 percent that i'm talking about so meet your deadlines and be happy with an 80 percent success rate Love of, it. Of, of of how you feel about things so i feel i mean these are already amazing piece of advice the pieces of advice but i'm gonna ask the last question that i always ask anyway in case you do have something else uh, un under uh, your belt so to speak for this i always ask every guest if you were to jump back in time and give yourself one piece of advice so almost like if you had one piece of advice for people starting out today what would that be um i i've mentioned that before to um um to not run too quickly into opportunities that are presented in front of you think about them is that really good for me am i signing a contract here maybe that is that is wrong you know um and before you do anything else really uh uh find a good person who's who is who is maybe experienced and can guide you a little bit you know you might be able to avoid a lot of mistakes that artists do because if you're a young artist in this world you're kind of a, a you know a really nice victim to a lot of uh, experienced business people out there who try to take advantage of you and you might end up and there's many and there's millions of stories of, of biographies of artists who, who like anybody, like David Bowie, the Queen, Freddie Mercury, who who ended up with the wrong with the wrong people around them, giving them wrong advice, and that almost cost them their their career. And um, yeah, like don't rush into things. Like think about them maybe two or three times before you sign a contract, before you do this, before you do that. And while doing though, like. There's, there's, there's many advice. There's only not one advice, but another one that I would want to give is like, be yourself really. Like you, like stop comparing yourself to others. I still have to tell us myself every day, you know, it's like, you're very unique. You're, you're in your unique, unique thing on the table. You obviously like what other people are doing and you would want to be like this guy or you would want to be like this guy, but you're not, you are yourself. And there was a great quote by Oscar Wilde that I'm, um, that I'm, that I'm always falling back to is like, be yourself because everyone else is already taken. Yeah. Um, and that is that makes so much sense. And it's like, you know, you you can only do what you can do. If you're trying to copy other people's stuff, you it's not yourself. It's not going to be lasting long. You might have short term success by doing so. There's a lot of examples for that that made a lot of money in their lives, you know, and be we're, we're up on the top of the game for like two, three years. But how is their life after that? You know, it's like, you know, and if you're if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably already like trying to fulfill your life with the music that you love and then just go that way, you know, and do not compare you. Don't waste so much time in the Internet and compare yourself with others. Rather sit on your synthesizer and, and work on the next sound that you want to do. Yeah, love it. Fantastic. What a great way to, to close out the podcast. Thank you so much. And um, what have we got? That we can look forward to coming from you are you doing anything for example to promote the 100th release on clr live shows coming up what uh, what can we look forward to chris you know the dj business is always a funny business when i 
um, because you're constantly promoting yourself out there anyway, you know, you're just you're constantly playing DJ gigs. Um, so what I'm looking for is my, now that, can I say that the pandemic is officially over? I, is I, it? I, you can say it, whether it's true or not, I don't know. <laughs> can, I, can, can I just force this upon everybody? The pandemic is not officially over. Let's let's dive into this new world. You know, we've all went through like two, two to almost three years of, of being on our own and not being out there. Um, we had time to, loads of us had time to reassess your own situation. Um, like, I want to go out there and be my possible, be, be the best possible version of myself in a way of the music that I'm playing. I want to have fun and I want to uh, 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 find great new artists and I want to support those. And I want to, what I'm trying to do is uh, also get those two worlds together that I've been working on for the past uh, six, seven years. And this is the music that I make for Mute Records. Um, together with uh, Alf Hildenbeutel to bring this more on the dance floor. So ultimately, there will be um, will be sort of a life act. I would maybe it's a life act where I'm going to be pre pre presenting all that music that I've done for the albums Burn Slow and Another Day on a dance floor version in a techno context. Cool. So uh, so that's something that I'm trying to achieve this year as well. Next to do all those DJ gigs and and continue to. Well, 100 is a great number, but that's already old for me. You know, it's like I want to like the next thing, the next thing. And I can't wait to be back in my studio because I was just gone for three weeks again to to sit down and work on stuff. And uh, oh, man, we could have like make this podcast so much longer because there's another thing which, you know, talking about being back in the studio. Guys, don't don't wait until you have a great studio. You know, make music on your laptop <laughs> with some headphones. There's there's really nothing you need. But this, you can build a great studio. This is great. But if you want to just make music, don't wait for the time that you have built the studio. Just start on it now with, with your laptop. You can do it anywhere. This is what I just noticed when I said I can't wait to be back in my studio. But my studio is my happy place. I'm looking at a mountain and it's, it is beautiful in there and it's very inspiring. And I feel that right now. So I'm excited about what's to come. Whatever that, that, that is. Brilliant. Well, I, I'm going to, I'll take you up on that as well. The idea we could have had double the podcast and 100% yes. invite you back for a part oh, two. Please. Because you've shared so much sort of knowledge and experience and it, it means the world, you know, to me, but of course, to people listening to be able to get an insight into someone who's lived the life you've lived and had these touch points and you've talked about the highs and some of the lows and difficult things and yeah of course there's a, there's a ton more um that we could talk about and you're providing so much value so i'd absolutely love to to welcome you back but for this episode thank you so much it's been just awesome sitting talking to you thank you so much i'm 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 happy to to be here and i'm totally up for part two so thanks for having me beautiful <laughs> take care and i'll speak to you soon was awesome. Thanks, Steve.